Well, good morning. That, uh, that scripture that you heard read is the scripture, let me say it again, good morning. That scripture you heard read is the scripture we're going to walk through today. And uh, good to be here with you and to be able to share God's word together. If you have your Bible, you can take it out or turn it on and follow along if you'd like. I'm going to talk about today how we represent Christ in our work and at our work, but also in the way we work. We represent Christ in our work and at our work, but also in the way we work. The scripture's already been read. A few things worth noting from the text. I, I, we're actually walking through the book of Ephesians here in chapel. And so uh, we're coming to this passage here today and we'll be able to walk through it. I told Chaplain, uh, Chaplain Waybright that as we go through Ephesians, I see I get the hard passages, but that's okay. I'm happy to do that. Second, this is in a broader section that as you've probably already learned with our Bible and theology faculty doing their excellent job teaching uh, New Testament, this is in a section that we call uh, household codes. It's explaining how Christians should relate to one another in the relationships that they have. There's a lot going on here in this short message that I can't address, but Paul's giving direction to Christians in their situations, not affirming all of their situations, but addressing them where they are. That'll be important later. A third in our section, he addresses work. Um, he does not use the word employee because that's not what it looked like back then. There were often masters and there were bond servants, sometimes translated as slaves, and some people who worked freely for wages as well. But depending upon who's doing the estimating, maybe half the Roman Empire was in this state of bond service or slavery. And the end of slavery this time is far, far off. It's far, far off. Uh, and matter of fact, it's not just that. The rise of the middle class is centuries away. Unions and workers' rights are millennia away. Also, this passage can be jarring to us in ways that would be different than how the passage might be jarring for them. For us, it's jarring to talk about masters, bond servants, and slaves. For them, it would be jarring to actually talk about bond servants as people who have value, to see them as people, using our language today, made in the image of God. Aristotle called a slave a tool with a soul. This passage was jarring to a culture that thought that way. And yet the New Testament does not directly attack slavery, but faith in Christ and biblical teaching, even represented here, undermines it. So the gospel cut against the grain of Rome by valuing the bondservant as a person made in God's image and having eternal value as seen by the fact that among other passages, not this, this passage, this passage doesn't address everything we'd want to cover, but there's actually an epistle in the New Testament, Philemon, directly related to a believing master and slave Onesimus. So Paul confronts the situation, addresses in a household in this whole section, right? We could go back all the way to chapter 5, verse 18, talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit, submitting to one another in chapter 5, verse 21, and continuing through this passage. So he addresses the issues that they were dealing with in that day, and my dad does so in a way that would undermine the entire structure of Roman society, including slavery. Now, I won't be able to cover everything here. I'm, I'm actually used to preaching 40 minutes, I have to confess, as some of you who attend High Point here in town know, I'm teaching pastor there. Uh, but I, I won't cover everything, and I won't cover everything that I would want to cover, but we'll cover specifically what Chaplain Waybright asked us to cover, and that is working as unto the Lord. So our job is to ask, as it come to any text, is to ask the question, what is this text saying to the original hearers? And then asking, what's the universal underlying truth? And then what is the application today? So we might ask, why do you work? To earn a paycheck, to pay the bills, to fulfill your purpose, some other reason? For many, work is a necessary evil, right? It's something we have to do, but, but actually God has given work to his children, gave work to Adam and Eve before the fall, and work is a way to bring glory to God. Today we're going to look at the topic as working as for the Lord, because as followers of Jesus, everything we do is ultimately to be for his glory and our good. So to get to the text, I actually want to start with another text. It's actually 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Here's what it says. It says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all for the glory of God. And this passage in Ephesians points us to this reality. We represent Christ in our work and at our work, but also in the way we work. So now we apply 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to work as this passage 
does. Let me quote one of the world's leading scholars on work and our faith. She wrote, by embracing our ordinary lives for what they are, we can become attentive to God in the midst of the work, in the midst of the ordinary. If God cared enough to show up at the wells and in the bushes and in the boats and in the kitchen, at meals and in vineyards, then certainly he can show up in the spreadsheets, commutes, meetings, and performance reviews. That scholar's Denise Daniels, who teaches right here at Wheaton with us. So again, to the text, um, and again, we're not going to cover everything needs to be said, but, and this is not everything the Bible says on the topics here, but it's an important part of it. So let's jump in and walk through the text. The first thing I want you to see is, is everyone should see their work as worship. Everyone should see their work as worship. We too often separate worship from the everyday aspects of our lives. We just were led in a beautiful God-honoring time of worship. But worship is not only a service in a sacred place, it's a lifestyle that we live moment by moment. Our lives are to be lives of worship, which includes our work. And we see this actually even in the language that Paul uses. Let me quickly go through and deal with the language of what we might today refer to as the employee, the bondservant and slave. He says, obey as you would Christ in verse five, or as bondservants of Christ in verse six, or doing the will of God from the heart in verse six, or rendering service with a good will as to the Lord in verse seven. He will receive back from the Lord in verse eight. It's clear that Paul in this letter is saying that your work is ultimately unto the Lord. To the employer, do the same because he is both their master and yours in heaven. And verse 9 says there's no partiality with him. Keeps coming back over and over again. And we would do well 2,000 years later when we consider our work to keep coming back to the call of the Lord to our work. And there's all different kinds of work. Someone serving as a pastor of a church is no more important in that role than an employee working in retail who follows Jesus. A nurse serving the Lord at Rush Hospital is serving the Lord as much as I am as a professor and a dean. And one of the most important things is that all jobs have a spiritual component when spiritual people are engaged in God-honoring work. We, we, we know that. We know to encourage people to work hard and to do well. When I was, something showed up on my uh, email from a Google alert, and it was Coach Jesse Scott talking about our, our loss. He said, I'm quoting him. I watched the video twice. He said, hats off to Central, unquote, which, by the way, is a classy way to work and to show leadership. But then he said this, I'm proud of our team and the way they competed. And then he went on to commend their relentless effort. And I want to join him in saying to our football team, you worked hard and we're thankful for you. Can we just thank the football team for their effort? You see, as coach calls out this relentless effort, this is not just for ourselves, for the team, and it's ultimately for the Lord. And by the way, let's not forget how hard our women's soccer team fought. In the midst of challenges and difficulties, how hard they fought as well. And basketball, keep on going. And this is the way we exhort each other. Let's work hard, but the reminder here to the Christian is to work hard as unto the Lord. I talked to my daughter yesterday in part because she wants a new computer on what is now today Cyber Monday. So she called me, but I was encouraging her to finish the semester strong. She's a former conservative, graduated last year, now doing her master's degree at the University of Toronto. So I encouraged her the same way I encourage you. That's your work now. Do your work as unto the Lord. We represent Christ in our work and at our work, but also in the way we do our work. Ming Dong Paul Lee from Business and Economics likes to put it this way. It's important for Christians to be in all walks of life, redeeming every part of our society for Christ and his kingdom. We've actually had the privilege of partnering with Dr. Lee now and launching our master's in global leadership, bringing ministry and business leaders together to explore this kind of work. Why? Because it matters. Because we represent Christ in our work and at our work, but also in the way we do our work. So number one, Everyone should see their work as worship. Number two, employees should serve the Lord in their work. Let's look at this. We're going to slow walk through the text, if that's okay. 
We're going to look at God's word and see what it has for us today. Let's ask the first question, how? How do we do that? Well, Paul actually gives a number of practical ways to serve the Lord in our work. It says one way to do is to follow instructions eagerly. The language here, obey your earthly masters. But obey means to hear under. It's the, from the word, we actually get the word acoustics from that word in the original language. It means to listen well, right? Uh, notice earthly, right? These are your earthly. The, the relationship here was temporary as even today the employer-employee is temporary, but one's relationship with Christ is eternal. But then it says, show respect to your employer as to the Lord. The language here in the text is with fear and trembling. And again, the language here, we could unpack more if we had more time, but for us, it might be a reminder 2,000 years later to have a sense of appreciation, to have a sense of reverence in which we approach work and how we even work with those who we work for. My boss is actually Provost Karen Lee. And she's, uh, I have respect for her. She's doing a great job. I have respect for her role in the role that she holds. She's a joy to work for, and, I, and, I, and, and she has a hard job. I take my job seriously and try not to make it harder for her. See, we represent Christ in her work and at our work, but also in the way we do our work. And we actually find this described in the way Paul lived his life in other ways, in other verses, in other places. In Philippians chapter 4, he says this, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Sometimes we see that verse taken out of context in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places. But it actually has to do with how we respond to our situation, our finances particularly, but that relates to our work. Let's keep walking through the text, right? It next talks about have a sincere heart as you would Christ. So we're doing our work with a sincere heart as you would Christ. Be focusing on those things while you work. Literally, it's to be unwoven in your heart with a singleness of purpose, right? When you're working, give your full attention to your work. The first rule of being a witness at work is to be the kind of worker that can be a witness, Living in the present matters, right? We represent Christ in our work and at our work, but also in the way we do our work. Wheaton graduate Jim Elliott put it this way, wherever you are, be all there. And there's also a servant's heart that's actually taking place in this workplace, right? It's actually maybe even more than that. And so how do we, how do we think about how to, to live this out in our own lives, right? Well, then it says this phrase as bond servants of Christ. This is language Paul loved to refer to himself as. In Philippians 1.1, he referred to himself as, right? So he wants us to have a servant's heart because we're submitted to the Lord Jesus. And doing, it goes on to say, doing the will of God from the heart. So all these are exhortations to us in the kind of person that we are going to be in the kind of work that we're going to do. It goes on to say, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord. That's a key phrase for us today, as to to the Lord. Goodwill is literally a good mind or having a positive attitude towards work. Now you might say, well, well Ed, I mean, my work is difficult or, or I don't like the job that I have, right? And, and we have to acknowledge that, that, that we see this through our own cultural lenses and our own cultural eyes. You, you might say, Ed, is this like a 40 hour work week? Is that what it's talking about? Well, no, that wasn't a concept they would have had 2000 years ago. Probably more than that. And before you say, well, then are you going to tell us we've got to work more than 40 hours? And I'll, you know, I want you to okay boomer me yeah. since I'm not a boomer. But I don't, I don't think this passage is saying let's work seven days a week without stopping. But is it, is it 40 hours? Actually, then it was more than that. They were encouraged to take a day of rest, but yet, yet people around the world at different times work in different patterns, right? For long parts of history, people only worked during certain seasons and worked like crazy during the harvest. And then there would be long seasons when they didn't. Our sisters and brothers in Europe might work less hours. In other places, they might work more hours, right? The pace and amount of work is important, and working hard is part of that. But that means different things to different cultures at different times. The point with us is it's with integrity, rendering service as to the Lord. And again, we represent Christ in our work and at our work, but again, also in the way we do our work. And, and then it goes on regardless of our circumstances. It says, whether bond or free. 
And maybe 2,000 years later, we can apply that and say, whether we, we, we like our work or don't like our work, we still do it as unto the Lord. And then Paul talks about some things not to do, right? He says, don't do it for eye service. Maybe working inconsistently, right? One works hard in front of their eyes, in front of their employer, and not as much when that employer is gone. Don't be as people pleasers, he goes on to say. And then we get to the why. We've got the how, let's get to the why. Knowing that whatever the Lord, whatever good, this is Ephesians 6, 8, knowing whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bondservant or free. Whatever good anyone does, he will receive back from the Lord. It reminds us of what Paul says elsewhere in Galatians, where he says, don't be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap corruption. And the one who sows to the spirit will reap eternal life. Number three, employers should submit to the Lord and honor their workers. What might be jarring to us is language of masters and bondservants. What would be jarring to them is the idea found in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 8 and 9. Masters, do the same to them. Do the same to them. And stop threatening, knowing that he who is both, master, who is both their master and yours, don't miss this, he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. That was jarring to the people of the first century. And so 2,000 years later, we can look as employers and say, what does that matter for us? If indeed we represent Christ in our work and at our work, but also in the way we do our work. You know, one of the things that we do here at Wheaton every few years that you may not be aware of is we do a survey of the staff. It's called the Best Christian Workplaces Institute Survey. And so everyone gets the survey who's on staff, they fill it out. And one of the things you can see and learn from is, because this is what we want to see and learn, is how can we be better employers? How can we be better at serving those who serve you? And Wheaton's a good place, but not a perfect place. There are places we learn and we want to improve in. One of the things that I saw in the first time, and then the second time I saw the Best Christian Workplaces survey, I saw one area particularly stand out. That area was Honey Rock. I think a few of you have been to Honey Rock, and if you haven't yet, I encourage you to go. Rob Ribby leads there. He's one of the best leaders we have because of how he leads well at Honey Rock. I have the privilege of serving him and Honey Rock as the dean over the program. And so I texted him and I said, tell me a little bit about what's going on. Maybe work in something. And his response quickly to me was about Scott Epler, who's our grounds manager, who serves well. But his dad passed away last night suddenly, and he said he could use our prayers. You see, Rob's the kind of leader who cares about the people that work for him and work with him. He models that kind of leader, and we can see it in surveys, and we can see the excellence that's there. And across this campus, we'll find those excellences reflected. And so Paul gives this instruction, do the same to them, and stop threatening knowing that there's no partiality with him. In case you haven't noticed, there's a lot of jobs that are open today. Lines are longer. Um, even prior to the pandemic, though, people were noticing the connection that was often there. According to Inc. Magazine's article about Gallup's survey, the single, single biggest decision you make about whether you're happy or unhappy with your job is who you name as your manager. In other words, a lot of managers could use Paul's teaching here in the scripture. Things like do the same to them, uh, do not threaten, and more. 2,000 years after this was written, I was working with Lowe's, Home Improvement Warehouse. I was part of a team of consultants that was trying to help them to deal with their labor relations. And we would actually call every employee in every store and they'd do a phone survey. And, and my job was to work with the team. We would go find the bottom 10%, the worst stores with the lowest satisfaction in their employees. My job then was to train the team to go out into those stores and to try to address the problems. Can I tell you the problems were always a problem of management and leadership. Because you have been blessed and privileged to walk through a Wheaton College education, you are disproportionately likely to end up in a role where leadership and management is part of your call. And we could go out and find it and say, we got to address this. Sometimes we got to get a new manager. Sometimes we help the manager be a new person. 
And I would say to you that this is a reminder to you as well. And the way we treat people made in the image of God, worthy and dignity and respect, shows how we value our work. We represent Christ in our work and at our work, but also in the way we do our work. So my encouragement to you is simple. We're walking through the text. It doesn't say everything we'd want to say about every topic that's touched on here. But our call is to work as unto the Lord, to make it our priority to honor the Lord in what we do and in how we do it. And I recognize that right now, with just a couple weeks left in this semester, you're probably tired. And I hope that this could be one small exhortation to you to go to the Lord this day and say, Lord, I want to finish well. The exhortations that we hear in God's word call us to live and to engage in work differently. And as we are Wheaton College, we want you to go as representatives of Christ in his kingdom to show the kind of work and the kind of representation of Jesus in the workplace that reminds you and me that we represent Christ in our work and at our work, but also in the way in which we do our work. Thanks for the opportunity to share with you.